Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and when we last left off with Claiborne, he had been passed up for Corps Command, and the Army of Tennessee had been backed up all the way to Atlanta. John Bell Hood took over from Joseph E. Johnston, and the young general knew what the President of the Confederacy expected of him. Johnston fell back, but Hood would attack. One of his first offensives came at Peachtree Creek, where Hardy's Corps and Stewart's Corps were to attack Union troops commanded by George Thomas. Claiborne was kept in reserve until word came to Hood and Hardy that the Confederate right flank was in danger. Hardy immediately sent Claiborne to relieve the forces of Joseph Wheeler, who was barely holding off the Union assaults. Claiborne's men arrived near midnight, and unable to see the terrain or make out the enemy positions in the dark, Wheeler's men whispered to the infantry that the slightest noise would cause the Federals to open up their artillery and musketry. When the cavalry pulled out, the infantry took their place, but they found no breastworks or fortifications. They were forced to stab their bayonets into the hard ground to dig up dirt in order to create rifle pits. The digging made enough noise that a Union battery not far from Claiborne's position opened up at close range. In the darkness, they hadn't realized how close the enemy actually were. Nearly 40 men were obliterated by the artillery blasts. Claiborne's men worked feverishly to construct entrenchments, and by the next morning, the Union resumed their attacks. The cavalry to Claiborne's right fired one volley and ran away, forcing Claiborne to use his reserves to extend his flank. However, that was not enough. He sent word to Hood to send him reinforcements. Cheatham's old division, now commanded by George Maney, secured his flank. Night finally came, and Claiborne's men were ready for a reprieve. They had been fighting all day. Claiborne commented to Hardy that it was one of the hardest fights he had ever been in. But as darkness set, word came to Claiborne to abandon his position that he had worked tirelessly to defend. However, the withdrawal wasn't to rest. It was to be used in another attack. The men marched into Atlanta and took a short break while Claiborne conversed with Hardy. Hood approached Hardy and informed the Corps commander of his orders. Hood wanted Hardy to do a roundabout march some 15 miles by dawn of the next morning and attack a federal column moving toward Atlanta. The men had barely slept in two days and had seen hard fighting all of those days. This would be a Herculean task. For 48 hours, the men of Hardy's Corps had fought or marched. Hardy let them sleep for two hours while he, Claiborne, and the rest of the division commanders strategized. Claiborne and Maney would be on the left, while the other brigades would be on the right. The men didn't get into position until nearly midday, and the horrendous summer heat beat down on the gray-clad troops. The assaulting Confederates completely surprised the Union troops, catching them off guard. Claiborne's men moved deep into the Union lines, and a few soldiers saw an officer on horseback. They called to him to halt and surrender. According to the gray infantryman, the officer touched his hand to his hat and then wheeled about to ride off. The southern men fired a volley into the man. The officer turned out to be Major General James B. McPherson. The attack was initially successful, but the heat caused many soldiers to pass out from heat stroke. Nevertheless, they continued to attack. General Govan requested support and Claiborne told one of his aides to find General Lowry and tell him to support Govan. On his way to find the other brigade, the staff officer saw that a gap was forming between Claiborne's division and Walker's division. The aide approached Lowry and informed him of Claiborne's orders, but also told him about the gap. Lowry filled the gap instead of assisting Govan. When Claiborne heard about this, he was pleased. He was never in favor of blind obedience. If his subordinates saw a problem or an opportunity, he had taught them to disregard his orders and take action if it assisted or helped the overall situation. His relationship with his subordinates was more of a relationship than a hierarchy. Instead of assisting Govan with Lowry, he ordered up an artillery battery to blast away at the stubborn Federals. When the artillery commander reported that the Union troops had pulled back, Claiborne gave a big smile and yelled, Generals to the front! He spurred his horse and rode with his men into the Union lines on Bald Hill, but after 45 minutes of fighting, Claiborne could not dislodge the third Union line, so his division, along with Maney's, settled into the second set of entrenchments that they had captured and dug in. Hood's plan was for Hardy's Corps to strike the flank of the Union Army, then he would send in Cheatham's Corps to land a decisive blow. However, Hood held Cheatham back, 
hoping that Hardy could move more of the Union line north so that Cheatham's attack could be more destructive to the enemy. By not ordering Cheatham to support Claiborne at the critical moment, the opportunity was missed, and when Cheatham's corps did make their attack, it yielded no significant result. Although Hood declared the Battle of Bald Hill as a victory, at best it was indecisive. Hardy reported 3,299 casualties. About 40% of those casualties were from Claiborne's division. The 1,388 casualties suffered in Claiborne's brigades in that one battle was more than all the previous battles of that campaign combined. On top of that, the attacks had removed many officers from field command. 30 of his 40 field grade officers in his division had become casualties. Eight of the 15 regimental commanders in the division were killed or wounded. Lowry's brigade lost 578 men out of the approximately 1,000 men he took into battle. As he said, his brigade was cut to pieces. Hood now brought his forces into the fortifications of the city. Around this time, General Stephen D. Lee, a distant cousin of Robert E. Lee and just 30 years old, took command of Cheatham's Corps, forcing Cheatham back to divisional command. After W.H.T. Walker's death, his division was broken up and the brigades were distributed among the rest of Hardy's corps. Claiborne received Mercer's Brigade, commanded by Charles Olmsted. It had seen light duty by garrisoning Savannah, but had been thrown into the Army of Tennessee when manpower became a larger problem. Claiborne wrote to Hardy that the untested nature of the new troops to his division was unsettling to him, and that their commander was inefficient. On August 30th, reports came to Hood that a strong federal column was near Jonesboro. The army commander called Hardy to his headquarters, and Claiborne was to lead the corps to Jonesboro. Along the march, Claiborne rode ahead and found federal infantry guarding a bridge along his route. Knowing that he needed to get to Jonesboro quickly, instead of deploying to fight the enemy, he took his men on a different route and avoided the enemy entirely. His staff noticed that Claiborne was visibly anxious. He didn't know how large of a force awaited him at Jonesboro, and his troops were marching through the night. It was daylight before Claiborne's troops made it to the destination, and Hardy along with Stephen D. Lee's corps joined him. Hardy asserted control over both corps, allowing Claiborne to command Hardy's corps during the impending battle. Nearly 20,000 Union soldiers were entrenched in a semicircle with their flanks anchored on the Flint River. Claiborne was to swing northward, and once heavily engaged, Lee's corps would attack the Union front. The plan was similar to the way Bragg had envisioned the Battle of Stones River plan out. Claiborne had personally seen the problems that arose in such an attack when the front line did not move in the designated direction. His division had to close up the gap when McCown's division moved west instead of north. He instructed each of his divisions to dress to the left in the attack and drive the enemy across the river. Major General George Maney, a veteran of the Army of Tennessee's bloodiest battles, misunderstood the orders and ordered his men to dress to the right in the attack. The Confederates stepped off at 3.30 p.m., and the first elements of the enemy the Corps encountered were dismounted cavalry. When those troops began to run, Claiborne's division, commanded by General Lowry, pursued after them to the east instead of pressing north. This left Brown's division and Maney's division to attack the Union position alone. Maney, when he saw Lowry's men move east, attempted to fill that gap with a few of his own brigades, but this took troops away from the reserve that was to exploit a breakthrough. That was not the limit of their troubles. Claiborne had to pull his corps back because the attack was so disorganized. What he didn't know was that Lee, instead of waiting until Claiborne was fully engaged, attacked an hour before Claiborne ever moved to make the attack. The frontal assault resulted in a bloody firefight that gained no ground. Hardy had no choice but to pull his troops back. The next day on September 1st, Claiborne knew what to expect. Union troops filed to his right in their new position. Many of the Southern soldiers admitted that it was a poor position, but the men had dug in as best they could. Wave after wave of blue troops surged towards Claiborne's division, the hinge of Hardy's Corps. Lee's Corps had been ordered north to Atlanta, so there was no help for Hardy. Govan's brigade took the brunt of the attack, but it was getting ready to break. Govan's men swung their muskets like clubs, the artillerists plied their ramrods. Sweet's battery continued to fire even as the Yankees swarmed over the works. A soldier in the 1st Arkansas wrote, We were surrounded and fought in front and in the rear, fought as General Claiborne always fought. An aide rode up to Claiborne and informed him of the breakthrough. Hardy overheard and sent the Corps' reserves. 
Vaughn's Tennessee Brigade. Claiborne personally led them to the breakthrough and mended the battle line. However, Govan and nearly his entire brigade had been captured. As night fell, Hardy knew that remaining on the battlefield would spell disaster for his corps. Now, Sherman's troops were in between Hardy's corps and Atlanta. The Confederates began to march south in the darkness. As the depleted ranks of Hardy's corps traveled further and further away from Atlanta, they could hear the muffled explosions of Hood destroying war materials in the city that could not be brought with the Confederate Army. 